Defence Dialogue, a podcast discussing contemporary challenges in the area of European security and defence. Brought to you by the Martin Centre with Nicholas Novaki. Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to the uh, Wilfried Martins Centre for European Studies Defence Dialogue podcast and, and, and especially to the um, very first um, episode of the podcast this autumn season. I hope all of you have had a very pleasant time off uh, during the summer and you're kind of easing back into the um, working, working life uh, wherever you might be. My name, uh, as usually, is, is uh, Dr. Nicholas Novaki. I'm a senior research officer at the Wilfrid Martin Center, uh, and I'm happy to be talking uh, to you uh, again today about like some topical issues related to uh, European Union security and defense policy. And then with me, as uh, as as, uh, as always, uh, I have a very good uh, colleague and friend, uh, Mr. Alvaro de la Cruz. Alvaro, like thanks again for being here. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me again. And. Let's go back to school. How was uh, how was your time off and how was your holiday? It was it was beautiful. Like most of Europeans, we could enjoy again of uh, a little sense of, of normality. But uh, I have to admit, it was a little bit sad of with all of the developments coming from from Afghanistan. It, I had to admit it, it it affected me personally, uh, as it did to many of us. Indeed, and, and and I think kind of one person who probably or absolutely did not have a very pleasant summer was uh, U.S. President Joe Biden. Because indeed, I mean, like you mentioned, this whole um, Afghanistan debacle, like, I mean, took place at the lightning speed, like, in, in, in August. And every, every now and again, like, when the, when the European Union goes on holiday, like, during the, uh, during the summer season in August or then uh, around Christmas, we get these summer or Christmas um, surprises. And if I remember correctly, like, one of the Christmas surprises the late 70s, uh, when the European Union was on holiday, was when the Soviets uh, uh, launched an offensive like into Afghanistan. So like yeah. Afghanistan is another kind of holiday surprise for the European Union. Uh, so there's a sense of uh, deja vu about that. But of course, I mean, this, 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 this time the, the, the situation is very different. I mean, the scenario and, and, and the events that are taking place in Afghanistan are very different. The Taliban, uh, which were ousted from, from, from power in 2001 when the uh, US-led international campaign uh, um, was launched uh, into Afghanistan following the um, 11 September 2001 terror attacks, um, have now returned to power in a lightning offensive in August. The Taliban uh, took over town after town, city after city, and region after region. Uh, uh, in, in, in the country, culminating into the, uh, to the fall of uh, Kabul itself uh, in, in uh, mid-August. And, and um, this surprised uh, quite a lot of uh, observers, international uh, leaders, and, and, and probably the US president himself as well, because I mean, there had been like some intelligence analysis and, and intelligence reports that, that, uh, that, that were discussed uh, following the fall of Kabul and following the fall of Afghanistan that suggested that the, 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 there might be issues like with the Taliban like going forward and, and, and the uh, Afghan uh, army itself like might not have the capacity or the, the, the willingness to resist uh, a very committed uh, Taliban offensive. But, but, but uh, the United States uh, and most experts like seem to expect that they would this fall of Afghanistan, whether it, even if it if, if it would happen, it would at least take um, like some years uh, for it to take place. So there would be uh, plenty of time to prepare for a Taliban offensive. But uh, alas, uh, this uh, did not happen. Uh, the Taliban took over uh, following the U.S. Uh, decision to to withdraw its own forces uh, from Afghanistan. Um, this has been interpreted as, as uh, reflecting um, America's growing desire to pull out from what Biden has called uh, forever wars uh, in, in regions that do not have a direct national security, national interest uh, relevance to the United States, and, and, and uh, refocus especially on the Indo-Pacific region and, and, and uh, countering uh, the, the ever, ever continuing rise of uh, China's power and influence in that region. Following the fall of Kabul, there was also a very chaotic Western uh, campaign to evacuate uh, 
Western citizens and, and Afghan citizens like from um, Afghanistan like who had provided support and like collaborated and worked uh, with, with Western governments like during the uh, uh, international like, campaign in Afghanistan. And I'm sure like you as well, uh, Alvaro, you saw like some of the videos and images like when people were crowding in uh, Kabul airport, like trying to desperately uh, cling into the departing aircraft and like some even like falling uh, from, from the departing aircraft. It was absolutely horrible to see um, uh, th those images. And of course, there was also a terrorist uh, attack that was uh, carried out by an offshoot of ISIS, which uh, uh, took the lives of, of uh, um, tens of uh, Afghan citizens and, and also about 16 American servicemen, if I remember correctly, which again highlighted that uh, that uh, the, the, the messiness and, and, and the chaos like surrounding the, the, the departure of, of the Western uh, forces from the country. And finally, the final American troops were withdrawn on the 31st of August, uh, which marked the end of uh, this 20-year military presence in the country that had cost uh, uh, over $1 trillion, like for, for the Americans, and billions also like for uh, European countries, and uh, for the European Union uh, itself as well, because let's forget that the European Union has been one of the main suppliers of like aid and assistance uh, to, to, uh, to Afghanistan. After kind of all of this took place, uh, I'm sure Alvaro, you noticed as well that uh, the European Union was criticized like quite heavily again, kind of for its own invisibility, like in, in, in what happened in Afghanistan. Um, a lot of European countries like conducted like their own um, like national like evacuation operations you know, to evacuate their own citizens and, and those Afghans like who had um, helped them uh, during, the, during the duration of the uh, military presence there. Um, my own country, Finland, and, and uh, kind of our current home country uh, here, uh, Belgium, also conducted uh, national evacuation operations. Um, but there was kind of no coordinated or a joint EU effort, which was a little bit surprising, a um, little bit disappointing, at least, I think. And um, Finnish President Sauli Niinistö, for, uh, for example, as well, like criticized uh, or, or raised the issue of the EU's invisibility in Afghanistan, and which he has been kind of raising quite often in, in, uh, in, in whenever like major international events have taken place, because Niinistö is, is worried that the EU is losing ground and losing influence vis-a-vis -vis the major other major centers of world power and 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 uh, losing uh, influence and, and relevance. So a lot of, lot of um, problems and, and not a very rosy picture for the European Union as, as a collective actor. But of course, I mean, following uh, the, 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 the events uh, in Afghanistan, following the evacuation operations in particular, I mean, there's been quite a lot of discussion again about um, boosting the EU's efforts to achieve strategic autonomy and boosting the EU's kind of own capabilities um, in the area of crisis management so that it could in the future be a more effective and, and reliable actor and, and, and uh, conduct these sorts of like evacuation operations on its own. Um, Charles Michel, the European Council president, has spoken in, in several occasions about the need to uh, bolster the EU's efforts to achieve strategic autonomy and, and uh, uh, in the wake of uh, what has happened in Afghanistan. High Representative Josep Borrell has also uh, spoken uh, about the need uh, to create this 5,000 uh, soldiers strong initial entry force um, in the wake of Afghanistan to make sure that the, the EU would be better pre prepared to handle kind of an Af Afghanistan type situation. Um, but of course, this initial entry force is something that was proposed um, already earlier in spring. Uh, by a group of 14 countries in the framework of the um, like ongoing strategic compass process, which seeks to provide guidance for the EU security and defense policy. But, but um, now there seems to be kind of a growing momentum of creating some kind of initial entry force at least. Um, and, and, and this momentum is interesting because it's, it's the first time in several years, um, five, six years at least, I would say that we're again talking seriously about the operational dimension of the EU security and defense policy, because let's not forget that since 2016, the focus has been very heavily on, on um, 
uh, the the development of joint uh, capabilities, uh, joint uh, capability uh, research projects, etc., and the kind of operational crisis management dimension has been not neg not uh, totally neg neglect neglected, but has tot at least uh, been put on the sidelines a little bit. Um, and I think this is a little bit unfortunate because crisis management, like, was in fact the the whole original. Uh, purpose of, of, of the EU security and defense policy, um, which was created in the late 1990s, I mean, following the EU's failure to deal with the force of Yugoslav succession, following its failure to, uh, to deal with uh, without the US uh, in, in Kosovo uh, in, in 1999. So after like these failures in the late 1990s, I mean, the, the, there was initially the Helsinki headline goal, which was agreed in, in, in uh, 1999 which stated that the EU should be able to deploy 50 to 60,000 troops within uh, 30 days notice uh, so that it would be able to handle a Kosovo-type situation on its own. Of course, the, 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 the EU also has these high readiness, 1,500 strong uh, battle groups, uh, which have been operational since, since uh, 2005, but these have never been used, and, and I'm not even sure that like there was a serious discussion of, of, of using them in, in, in Afghanistan. But if, if there weren't, I mean, this is it's, 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 it's puzzling, a little bit puzzling uh, to me because these would be the perfect types of units to use to evacuate uh, European citizens, and given that they should be on stand uh, standby, there should ideally, or there, there should be. The EU's aim is that there should be two battle groups on standby uh, every six months. So, like, I mean, the, the EU should be able to deploy uh, two battle groups, I mean, when, if, if there would be separate crises. But the, 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 the member states have often, often been, like, rather uninterested and rather reluctant to contribute uh, capabilities uh, to the battle groups. So, um, if I remember correctly, there's currently only one battle group on standby in the second half of 2021. Um, and, and this is not the first time that the EU has struggled to fill, fill the battle group roster. Um, but just to kind of, the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make, or the point I, I want to make, is that uh, despite this, this idea of creating um, a new EU initial force, initial entry force, um, the, the, the idea that the EU should be able to deploy a sizable military operation on its own is, is not new by any means. Um, because of uh, the Helsinki headline goal, because of the existence of the battle groups. And even though the, the, the 5,000 strong, or the proposed 5,000 strong initial entry force would be significantly larger than the battle groups, the size is not really like that impressive to me either, because the, the largest military operations the Union has conducted so far is EU for Althea in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which at its height was Seven, about 7,000 strong, if I remember correctly. Like now, it's, it's, it's a lot smaller. It's, it's several hundred people. But at, it, at its height, when, when it was launched in 2004, it was about 7,000. So we know that the EU is able to conduct and handle like large operations already. So we, d we don't need a separate concept uh, for that. And what really is missing here, and what cannot be substituted by the creation of these additional military rapid response concepts is the political will among their member states to act, which is something that we've spoken about quite often in this podcast, I think, in the past as well, that you can have these discussions uh, in, in Brussels, you can develop all the concepts like you want, but ultimately, and especially in, in, in the area of security and defense, because we're acting and, and uh, deciding by uh, what to do by unanimity, the, the, the key really is the political will among the member states. If there's no political will, nothing happens, even if, 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 if we would have a nice new initial entry force concept. So I'll, uh, we'll see kind of what happens. I mean, I'm, I'm not too optimistic, even though I, I do expect that uh, some kind of initial entry force concept will now make it into the strategic uh, concept when it will be adopted in, in spring 2022. Uh, due to the political pressure created by uh, what has happened in Afghanistan. But I don't know, like, what do you think, Alvaro? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, I think, first of all, that we could do a weekly podcast only on Afghanistan and its repercussions on, on European security and defense <laughs> policy, and we'll have enough content for the next uh, few months. 
This is this is like the the, the Pandora box, like the either reopen or open for the first time. So many debates uh, again in the. I have so many questions and potential issues to come in with you. I'm gonna try to to, to keep it short and go probably on a chronological and zooming out uh, approach. Well, I'll try to have some answers at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, um, indeed, you pointed out that this shows again that the EU is losing influence and its its capability again. Uh, it's it's weakened or at least proven weak weak to 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 act, but at the same time I I feel like either way the situation the, the new reality is pushing the EU into having a, a bigger role in 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 the security and defense uh, matters and of course um, stability in, in regions around Middle East uh, Northern Africa either way because uh, let's not forget uh, over a year ago Mike Pompeo surrendered Afghanistan to the Taliban. Um, the reasons and, and, and agreements and how it will uh, definitely uh, benefit China, it's, it's still, uh, to me, a little mystery. But they fail, as you, as you, as you said, dramatically in, in, again, in intelligence. Uh, like, they, they said it would take from 30 to 90 days, at least, at the very least, for the Taliban to, to get to, to, to the doors of Kabul. And it took them six days. And again, what it proved, it has proven that, that again, our own intelligence either didn't, didn't work or we relied again in American intelligence because we gave those, those, those frames, time frames as, as good. And Europe was depending on American intelligence once again and, and uh, we were unprepared. But I think that at some point, Biden, the Biden administration is continuing or honoring a little bit this, this break um, moment in, in American recent history from for the first time a president says he doesn't believe in American uh, except, exceptional, exceptionalism and I think it's a difficult word ladies and it gentlemen is, yeah. it is especially for exceptionalism a Spaniard. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's tough tongue twister a little bit but it is true that apparently American politics whether it's Democrat or, or Republican do not believe in, in America's role as world policemen anymore and that is going to push Europe isn't it I mean, it's, if if because they are, they are they can afford to be uh, uh, isolation isolated because physically geographically they don't do not connect with Asian Africa as we do the home of Islamist terror and, and other and other threats. So, is isn't isn't Europe's faith? Isn't the, are when you we doomed to 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 jump in and and realize as soon as possible that we need to. To increase our capabilities and coordination, because there's there's probably less and less uh, to ex to be expected from our transatlantic uh, allies. Well, yes and no, I, I would say because I would I would say that I mean if you if we look at kind of like what has happened around like Europe's like geographical like neighborhood even in the past decade or so, it's like growing like instability like everywhere you look like whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Syria. Whether it's 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 Libya, whether it's 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 the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and now we have Afghanistan as well. Um, which, I mean, if we really want to extend Europe's like geographical neighborhood, neighborhood, I mean, it can be viewed as part of it. But I mean, despite this like growing turbulence and and despite the growing um, desire in in Washington to kind of refocus more and more on on, on the Indo-Pacific and 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 uh, uh, despite Washington's kind of increasing um, uh, the, the the kind of decreasing resources uh, in 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 the area of Europe, I, I think kind of Europe's own response has been kind of lackluster at best, and I think kind of. Not entirely like sure why. I think a big reason is that like many countries are, are very comfortable with the situation like they are in, and they don't really expect that what is kind of happening in in Europe's like neighborhood or the areas around Europe. I mean, would have serious like consequences for them. So there's a little bit of a this this ostrich mentality of like having your head in the sand, and and. Um, I agree that like this, like Afghanistan and all these other crises, they should ideally kind of push Europe to 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 uh, do more, push Europe to be more prepared, uh, push Europe to take its own 
security and, 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 and the security of citizens kind of more, more um, seriously. But unless the Europe's own house like is an imminent threat of, of catching fire, like the, it's, it's, it's very easy or it's too easy often to, to, to ignore and like leave these issues to others. The Ukraine crisis was interesting because after that, I think there was a there was this moment of increasing uh, like defense spending and defense budgets like began to increase increase um, quite a lot, quite significantly, like across Europe, and 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 they did continue to increase like all the way up until the coronavirus pandemic, and we have to kind of see what happens like now. When, when there's a pressure to, to, to put money into, into um, other, other areas. But whether Afghanistan will be that sort of shock that it will shock Europeans to kind of continue in investing heavily like into their own capabilities and, and whether it, it will like really increase the political, political will of the member states to act. Because I mean, I, th I think that's really the, the key here. I mean, if, if, if there is political will uh, to do something, then something happens. Um, but but Afghanistan, I think, is still in, in the minds of many European voters a rather distant place. It, it, it's a rather strange place. It um, it, 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 it's a rather kind of the implications of what ha what happens in Afghanistan uh, to 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 individual kind of European countries. I mean, is in the minds of many voters are probably like not clear. So the pressure to do something will probably be like fairly limited. So in the short term, yes, I think we'll get some kind of initial entry force concept, but I, I don't expect yet that, I mean, it will create that sort of sea change that, or change of mentality that ideally it should, uh, unfortunately. I agree, I agree. Uh, probably for most of the Europeans, uh, this is a very distant uh, conflict, not related to us. For many people in my country this, this summer, the conversation was, why is our duty to, to, to go defend a country that their soldiers are not willing to defend themselves? Because the data show that they had roughly 350,000 soldiers in the Afghan, Afghan army, counting, of course, volunteers and, 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 and not non-professional soldiers, well equipped and trained uh, for 20 years. But the thing is, Afghanistan might be far away, but in a, in a few months we shall expect hundreds of thousands of Afghan refugees arriving once again to our shores, and then maybe maybe this is a not directly um, a security and defense uh, implication, but it might be the moment uh, we, 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 uh, we hope not and we, we pray not, but there might be terrorists, uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists, uh, infiltrated in these groups of refugees coming, as it happened in the past, and, and the moment we have attacks in Europe once again, this is, this is going to come again to the surface and, and to the debate, and it shouldn't surprise anyone that uh, something different should have been done. Regarding, regarding the, these um, uh, different uh, possibilities of, of uh, European units or, or deployment, fast deployment um, brigades or, or battalions, why, I mean, why wouldn't, because we're talking about very few, as you say, like 5,000, in that sense, why couldn't we use, for example, the 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 the, 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 the forces of Eurocorps or another other other existing uh, instruments within the European uh, Union uh, security and defense that, that that don't require a new a new a new uh, a new mechanism a new mm -hmm. a new a new launching of, of, of a, a yeah. different a different platform. Well, I think if we if we look at the European Union, I think the answer to that is that the European Union is is is, is not very well handled to deal with like risky risky operations and risky business. I mean, it's true that I mean the EU, like in the past like twenty years, has conducted uh, like over like I think close to thirty civilian and military operations. I think the military operation number is is a bit less than ten, if I remember correctly. Um, but still a significant number of, of, of uh, military operations as well, uh, mainly in, in, um, in the Western uh, Balkans and, um, and, and Africa that have um, done various types of stabilization 
um, uh, missions in countries like uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Chad, um, uh, Central African Republic, also a couple of naval missions. However, the EU has been extremely, extremely selective in, in the types of missions, uh, military missions it has chosen, to, chosen uh, I underline, uh, to conduct. Um, the, the adversaries that the EU has had to face in these missions have been kind of fairly like lightly armed uh, militias and, and the balance of like power has been kind of overwhelmingly in, 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 uh, like in, in, in favor of, of, of the European uh, uh, troops uh, in these missions. The EU hasn't really had to deal with a really, really intense, risky conflict in which there would be serious, a serious threat or a risk that European like troops operating under the EU flag would have to come back in 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 in, in, in zinc coffins, basically. If I remember correctly, so far there's been only one casualty in EU military operations, and like that was a French soldier in the EU for Chad mission. And if I remember correctly, we have to check this. Um, that soldier died because, like, he wandered. Uh, to another side of the um, uh, outside uh, the Chadian border and, and uh, died in the desert, if I remember. So that what I'm trying to say is that there are no combat casualties. He hasn't like had to had to deal with a very intense like peacemaking operation. There have been ideas of using the battle groups in, in more kind of riskier situations, like in Libya in 2001. But there was no political willingness among the the, the, the member states to to use the battle groups there. So I think, I mean, if, if, if we want to, one of the kind of big things that is keeping us from use, taking better use of the existing instruments we have is that like the European Union is like shying away from like risk still. And, and you can't be a very effective international actor in the field of like crisis management, like unless you are willing to shoulder like risk and, and, and uh, act in dangerous and intense operations. It would be a little bit strange to kind of see the European Union acting in, in, in that sort of situation. And like so far, like NATO has been the framework of choice for, for, for European countries when it has been, has been about like really kind of dangerous, intense operations. So whether we look at like the Afghanistan mission or like Bosnia, for example, or others. But, but like I, I don't know like what would have to happen like for the European Union to kind of grow up and, and, and it, like in a sense that like it would be able to do what NATO does. Even though like the same like NATO consists mostly of the same countries as the European Union. But it lacks like certain the European Union lacks certain command structures. It obviously like lacks the United States as a leader. And there's no kind of equal like leader uh, in, in, in uh, the EU security and defense policy that, that could really like take over that role in, in the same way that the United States uh, does in NATO. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the risk aversion is one of the biggest things, I think. Yeah, surely. Uh, to me, it will be always very difficult to understand why it is different to have a casualty with a soldier with a national uniform rather than with a European uniform and a European badge. But if you imagine kind of how in, how how kind of intense like some national debates like on, on the European Union are already when we're talking about uh, things like the coronavirus like relief fund, uh, whether we talk about like whether a country like should remain um, a member of the European Union or not. And then if you imagine that into that same debate like would be injected uh, the additional fuel for the Eurosceptics that citizens from that country would come back in coffins from a European Union led like operation. I mean, that would be poison or like it would be a jet fuel to like for that kind of Eurosceptic debate. And I think this this probably is, is one of the factors like why the EU like is, is, is uh, not totally prepared to do what NATO uh, does yet. Um, I'm, I'm not sure kind of how, like, it would be interesting to comp like do an anal analysis actually of like how, how can NATO, the, the societies in NATO countries like react to casualties in NATO operations. But yeah, um, definitely. On the other hand, maybe a, a real, a real powerful security and defense policy with well-funded and, and well-equipped 
will lead to to destroy populist um, uh, propaganda from from governments like uh, peace in in Poland, saying that Europe is not willing to defend the Polish citizens and only they can rely on America, and maybe a strong muscle in from Brussels will will prove them wrong. Either way, the the the, the reality is that many Jean-Claude people Van Damme. <laughs> many people in Brussels, among them uh, our high representative Josep Borrell, said that this is a wake up call to increase our capacity and. Or most of all, that it is. This is not at all an invitation to withdraw for other missions and other duties that we have in in security in, uh, in uh, areas and peacekeeping in in many places in Africa. But the thing is, we we will need leadership to increase these capacities and really encourage these kind of uh, new instruments. Mm-hmm. And now that Brexit happened, and we thought that we could have benefited from 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 that fact that many many progress was interrupted by the British uh, reluctance to, to, to advance in, 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 a, in, a, in a stronger security and defense policy. Mm-hmm. First of all, it was surprising to me that immediately after the, the, the crisis in Afghanistan started in the extraordinary meeting by NATO here in Brussels, it was actually the, the, the British defense minister the only one calling for a, a, big, a, big, a bigger cooperation and, and involvement of our troops in Afghanistan to secure the, mm-hmm. the, the, the operation, but also Everybody looks now uh, into, uh, into Germany's eyes, look to Berlin. We have an election in a few weeks that might lead to a very left uh, wing, uh, extremely left wing uh, government, including in the coalition, a party that is even anti NATO. Mm. So, how, co- how bad could it be for uh, 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 um, the, the progress of the European security and defense policy and this kind of new battalions, if we had a total loss of, of any German leadership or even the country having Berlin going against these efforts? Well, it would not be, it would not be helpful for sure. And I think kind of one key thing um, for, for the success of any kind of EU defense effort is a strong German contribution. But Germany is still a little bit, has always kind of been, especially when we talk about like operational issues, a little bit ambivalent, and that's because like Germany still has its own like demons to deal with and its own his- historical baggage like to deal with, and German involvement in in out of area military operations is still a fairly new phenomenon. I think like, Kosovo in 1999 was one of the first ones, and then the Afghanistan operation as well was one of the first ones like since the Second World War, and the German society kind of is. And the way German Germans are kind of viewing the country's role on the on, on, on the international stage is evolving, and I hope it continues to 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 evolve in the sense that like Germans become more comfortable and more willing to assume a more a leadership um, uh, for, for a greater leadership role for the for the country on the world stage, but also like here uh, in Brussels at the European level. I think that's absolutely key. Uh, Germans can't shy away forever for kind of playing the same type of or equally big role like in foreign and security policy as they do in, 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 uh, in economics. Um, if they continue to shy away from that role, I mean, then, I mean, it's which other country? I mean, France perhaps, um, like, tries to play the, the leader role, but, like, I mean, Germany needs to be there too. Well, I definitely hope so. Uh, as said before, when we started the conversation, this could be a never-ending uh, debate, and we could be talking about this for, for ages. I will rather give the opportunity to our listeners to comment and, and, and ask questions in and, and social media, and uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you wrap up today's, uh, today's uh, uh, topic. Yeah, well, I mean, let's, let's see what happens. I mean, um, we'll, we can return to this topic uh, um, like uh, later on. Uh, during the semester, uh, see how things go, see how the EU's um, EU's kind of engagement uh, with 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 the new Taliban uh, government like will evolve, and and uh, what will happen with the initial entry force. So I mean, there's there will be indeed plenty to discuss about. But um, but yeah, I mean, we'll we'll wrap it up here, and I hope uh, you the the listeners, I mean, enjoyed this episode, and um, hopefully you'll have a pleasant day wherever uh, you might be listening. So uh, please join us again in, in, um, in, in the forthcoming episodes that we'll record uh, this semester. Talk to you soon again. Bye. Bye.
That was today's episode of Defence Dialogue. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.